All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on IECC 2021 and the architectural changes. I think Kevin's included a few more things, um, including some appendices review. So um, we should may or may not hit the full hour today, but we'll see what questions you have at the end. So this web webinar will be recorded and the recording is sent out to all attendees. If there are any issues with audio, just write me in the chat. My name is Erica Delalo and I'm a project manager for Noresco. This series is sponsored by the Colorado Energy Office with training materials created by Noresco. And Kevin and I have been working with the Colorado Energy Office to provide training just like this one. Here we have a list of the upcoming web Wednesday webinar series. Um, we're planning on adding more to that series. Um, to go through uh, the next following months. And I'll be sending out an email um, with the opportunity to register for that. Um, in addition, we also offer tailored group trainings or technical assistance for jurisdictions that are updating I codes. Feel free to reach out to me if you are interested in either of these. Um, and then in, in addition, we've put together a code adoption toolkit that reviews cost implementation implications of changing code cycles, the benefits, and a bunch of other compliance resources, including a troubleshooting guide that covers I-code conflicts, alignments, clarifications, paths of compliance, whole slew of information. So both of those resources can be accessed through the Colorado Energy Office's website. Um, and then to, throughout the webinar today, we do wanna encourage questions. So please use the Q&A function and I'll let our presenter know at the end. The chat window can also be used among participants, but please use the Q&A for questions. Um, there is also the ability to raise your hand at the end of the presentation, so I can then unmute you and you can ask Kevin directly. And then there will be a survey window that pops up following the webinar. If you could please take a minute to provide feedback we can, so that we can continue to improve on these webinars. I know that a few of you have pinged me about continuing education credits and um, the approvals have been sent or the course descriptions have been sent to ICC for approval. So we're just waiting on those. I think there's a little bit of a backlog. So bear with me, you will get your certificates. It will just be a little bit longer than normal. So today's presenter is Kevin Perry and Kevin is a certified commissioning professional with a decade of experience. He has provided over 100 trainings, probably more at this point, um, to contractors, architects, code officials. He is a plants, he is a certified plants examiner and inspector for the IECC and ASHRAE as well. So with that, Kevin, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and you should be able to share yours. All right, let's make sure uh, I did this right. Share and presentation. Yep, that looks okay. good. And I'm just going to get my screen, my notes up, and then we'll be on our way. All right, sounds good. Okay, uh, thanks Erica. So uh, as, as she mentioned, uh, we're gonna be covering the changes in the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code uh, in 2021 from the changes in, in 20, 2018. I always get uh, twisted up there. So some of the learning objectives today, as Erica mentioned, um, we will be looking at, this is uh, mostly geared towards architects, this presentation. So we're gonna cover the sections that close, most closely relate to that, which will be the building envelope section 402, uh, solar ready zone, appendix CB, and then also the solar energy or zero energy buildings, which is appendix CC. Uh, and those will be, uh, the two appendices will be a brief uh, 
overview of those, uh, what, have ch what has changed in there. So let's start with definitions. It's always important to know uh, what has changed, what, is in, what has been added. Um, there's been quite a few definitions that have, have changed throughout. Um, one of the uh, ones in there is testing unit enclosure area. Uh, again, these are, are mostly for architects, the, uh, the definitions that are, I'm including in, in this presentation. Um, so this has to deal with any uh, areas as dwelling unit, sweeping unit, sleeping units, occupiable condition spaces, uh, things like that. Uh, also, a new definition is a vegetated roof. There's a lot of talk going around, especially in different uh, jurisdictions about uh, requirements for vegetated roofs. So that has been included in the new uh, definition section. Um, and, and really that definition, I'm not gonna go through all the definitions, but it's an assembly of interactive, interacting components designed to waterproof the building's top surface. That includes by design vegetation and related landscape elements. And then the last one that we'll uh, talk about my little definitions guy cut it off, but uh, visible transmittance annually. Uh, and it's VT annual is the abbreviation or shortening of it uh, that they use. And then there are some definitions that they didn't uh, change or add, but they are, they did uh, update some of the means behind them, how they're um, defined in the code. So general lighting, greenhouse is now uh, a little bit more defined, curtain system, uh, on-site renewal, above grade wall, things like that. All right. So let's continue on to the next section. So uh, as some of you may know, there are different pathways that can be followed uh, in the IECC. Those pathways um, include a prescriptive or performance pathway. And um, with that pathway, uh, if you follow the performance pathway, they have updated some sections in here. So uh, this is really section 407. So it's kind of uh, out of the area. One of the things that I didn't really mention we we're going to cover, but it's important because if you are going to follow this pathway uh, for the envelope, they did make some changes on that. And you can see section 402.5. Uh, that would be the section for the architectural presentation we're doing uh, that we want to focus on. And so a performance pathway is if you're doing a model. So if you're doing a modeling pathway instead of prescriptive by the book, uh, then they do have uh, requirements and changes for the air, uh, air leakage and thermal envelope. And what that's saying is basically um, this section uh, must be um, completed. It can't be traded off. So. Usually when you do a, a model, uh, you can trade off some things as long as your, your model shows the energy uh, consumption being um, at the limit that the, the code requires, um, then you can trade off some things. However, this table tells you for the air leakage and thermal envelope 402.5, you cannot trade off that, you, ha you have to complete that. So in short, that basically means uh, no matter which pathway you go down, uh, you will have to do uh, that requirement. All right, uh, another thing with the performance pathway, this will be the last slide on that, is that they now define uh, the reference standard for your energy model. Uh, before, um, there was a little bit of a gray area on what you were supposed to use for your reference standard, but now in the code, they have called out what exactly um, you're supposed to use for the different components 
of your envelope, um, not just envelope, but also other systems. So just know that um, there are now standards that you have to, to use. And really what they're doing here is uh, they're trying to line up um, if you're doing a model pa pathway between IECC and ASHRAE, they're trying to line those up a little bit more closely uh, together. And so um, models are notorious for, you know, if you have five different people doing the same exact model, you'll have five different results. And so uh, one of the areas that they're trying to um, help with is to uh, tell everybody what the reference standard is to use. That way, maybe you would only get four different results uh, out of the five people. Okay, so existing buildings. Um, so this isn't, the code I always say isn't just for new construction. It's also for additions, alterations, repairs, uh, all the like. Uh, so existing buildings still need to comply with the code. Uh, that has not changed. What has changed is that uh, they've got a little bit more um, wordy, if, uh, if you will, on the lighting systems and uh, some of the mechanical systems. So uh, the lighting systems will need to comply with uh, any new lighting systems need to comply with the commissioning requirements on existing buildings. So I know sometimes that's in the architectural scope of work, uh, the lighting system, sometimes it's not, but that's why I mentioned it here that uh, if lighting is going to be upgraded in an existing building, it does need to be commissioned. And then also um, just to reiterate, uh, that if and when a roof needs to be replaced on an existing building, the R value of that roof insula insulation cannot be decreased. Um, so just know that that's a, it's kind of a given, but uh, they call that out in, in this code. All right, so general, uh, this is the general section in the IECC. Um, what this is saying is that they basically, they, add, they added a new section that requires this thermal envelope certificate. So the one that you see on your screen is for a residential building. Uh, this presentation is on commercial, uh, but this is an example of what they're looking for now on commercial buildings. So this thermal envelope certificate needs to be a, a permanent certificate uh, basic, that uh, has basic information on it. The R values, U factors, solar heat gain coefficient, your envelope test results, all those things need to be on this permanent certificate uh, that stays with the building. So it needs to be located somewhere in the building that uh, will be permanent and hopefully cannot be taken down. Um, in residential buildings, a lot of times they put it on the electrical panel. Um, I don't believe there's a standard yet that anybody has created on a good location for these to be um, pasted. But uh, this is something new uh, added to the code section that um, needs to stay with the building in 2021. Greenhouses. So remember in the definition, definition section, greenhouses were uh, a, was a new definition. And they started to add a little bit more detail on greenhouses. So out here in Colorado, um, greenhouses are mostly for uh, the marijuana business, but that's not always the case. There's uh, agriculture, agri agricultural businesses out here as well. And so they have now uh, defined what a greenhouse is and whether or not it's exempt from meeting or having to meet the envelope requirements. So greenhouses or areas that are greenhouses that have areas mechanically heated or mechanically cooled are exempt from the envelope requirements, except for, or sorry, uh, sorry, uh, not except for, 
Um, so they're exempt from the envelope requirements, but they uh, still have to follow the requirements set forth for windows and walls, uh, roofs, uh, interior walls if they have them in terms of um, insulation values or U factors or R values, things like that. Um, they basically, what they're except, exempting here is the testing requirement uh, for the envelope on greenhouses. So if you think of it that way, that's probably a better way to think of it than they're just exempt from having to meet all the envelope requirements. Greenhouses are now exempt from the testing requirements for envelope. So greenhouses have been added. There's been a lot of conversation about equipment buildings. What about equipment buildings? We have a lot of those. And um, this was in the code before, except for the square footage has now increased. So any equipment buildings um, that are 1,200 square feet or less are exempt um, from the building thermal envelope provisions. And that's the next slide. And so that that is your um, your R values for your walls and assemblies like that. This was, like I said, this was in the code before. However, it was 500 square feet or less. So equipment buildings that were 500 square feet or less were exempt uh, from the building thermal envelope requirements. They've upped that now to 1,200 square feet, which if you think about it, a 500 square foot equipment building is uh, on a commercial site is probably not going to have not going to happen too much usually those buildings are a lot larger so it makes sense that uh, they're starting to increase that square footage it's still important though um, to keep even larger buildings uh, that are semi-heated and cooled uh, with the, the correct envelope provisions of, of our values because of energy So here are the thermal envelope uh, provisions based on components. This is a slide that uh, if you're familiar with the code book, uh, this is a table straight out of the code. We are in climate zone five uh, in, in Denver, but actually Denver has a few other climate, or sorry, in Colorado uh, has a few other climate zones, but I've highlighted five for this presentation. Uh, and then it's a little bit hard to read. So what I did is I actually just uh, created a new slide to show you the changes on those. So you can see from the 2018 code to the 2021 code, uh, anything in red on your screen has changed. So um, some of the things I'll point out, you know, metal buildings, you increased your continuous insulation one R value um, metal frame buildings, your continuous in insulation, uh, two and a half. Um, you, you can see that, you know, the changes aren't um, unreasonable, but they have changed. And really, I think where this is going to is, is uh, based on your modeling. You know, you can't buy, it's going to be hard to buy material or spec of material that is only an one R value greater than the previous code cycle. Um, so I would say this is more geared towards um, the overall building model and energy usage is why they updated this table. Another item they've changed Slabs on grade. Uh, so there are insulation installation requirements. Uh, they, they broke them on, broken those out into two categories here, full slab and then the slab perimeter. So the full slab shall be continuous uh, under the entire area of the slab on grade, except at structural column locations or service penetrations. Otherwise, your entire slab has to have that continuous insulation. 
insulation that's required at the uh, heated slab perimeter, uh, just like we saw in the, the last slide, the perimeter of their slab, uh, isn't required to go below the bottom of the heated slab anymore. Um, but it is, or sorry, isn't, isn't it required to extend below, uh, which is defined by that table. Uh, it just now has to be the depth of the slab um, on there. And then we get to the window section of your envelope. The window section, again, this table is straight from IECC, and I've highlighted five for this presentation, um, just for ease of use. Um, and I'll point out that most of the U factors uh, have been have been lowered, uh, and they also changed some of the solar heat gain coefficients um, on that. So again. Made a, ta a little bit ta a table to make it a little bit easier on the changes, so you all can see side by side what has changed. Uh, anything in red has changed from the 2018 version to the 2021 version. One thing I'll note out, uh, note here besides the U factors is that uh, in 2018 um, we were looking at directional based for solar heat gain coefficient southeast and west versus north. Uh, they have now changed that to be fixed versus operable windows. So that's a, ch that, that's a big change now uh, in, in our mindset and thinking on how we design um, these windows. Uh, they're now, the solar heat gain coefficient isn't necessarily orientation based, it is now based on uh, operation. Okay, that brings us to air leakage. So this is one of the larger, uh, kind of a little bit more complex and confusing sections that they've changed in the book. So my goal here is to maybe give you the uh, cliff note version, if you will. Uh, but even myself reading through it, um, got a little confused. So hopefully this uh, clears up some, some confusion if you've already read the the code book on 2021. Air leakage. So all buildings have to have uh, some type of air leakage testing. And what they've done is created two groups. Either you're in the first group, which is group R and I occupancies, or you're in the second group, which is anything else besides that. <laughs> So if you're, you're either RI or other, um, and depending on which uh, group you're in, either the first category here on the screen or the second one, um, will tell you how you have to do your air leakage testing. And basically, that so that's a blower door test that has to be done. So if you're in R or I occupancies, you're going to follow one standard of testing um, that that closely follows the residential type standard of testing, along with the passing rate for those uh, types of occupancies. If you're anything else besides R or I, you then basically you will follow the commercial uh, testing requirements set forth in there. If for some reason you are exempt and you're not in, you know, this RI category, or sorry, if uh, you're exempt from the RI category or air leakage testing category, because there are exemptions for air leakage testing in the code. If for some reason you are exempt, you still have to meet the materials section. So all your air barrier materials still need to be compliant with the code. Your assemblies have to meet the air barrier uh, section, which is partial testing of leakage there. And you have to meet the envelope performance verification section of the code. So 
like I said, a little confusing, uh, but just it, the easiest way to keep in mind is that no matter what, you're going to have to do testing on your building envelope. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be air testing. If not, uh, then there are some other tests or materials that need to be spec'd to meet, the, meet that code. So a little expanding a little bit more on those groups and those testing standards. So again, broke them out into the two groups, R and I occupancies. Your testing standard will be 0 0.30 CFM per square foot of envelope area. That will be your passing rate. And if you're anything else, then your passing rate is 0 0.40 CFM per square foot of envelope area. Now, on the other than R and I occupancies, you'll see that you could go up to 0 0.60 CFM of envelope area. Um, however, if you fall between 0.4 and 0.6, um, you know, you can go up to that value. You'll need to do some additional work. So if you're familiar uh, with some of the Denver amendments, they actually had something very similar to this where that since this is a newer test that uh, some folks aren't as used to, uh, there is some concern on whether or not the building envelopes are gonna perform uh, this well, uh, given that the installers still need to catch up on, on some of these. And so if you are over 0.4 CFM on the R and I occupancies, but below 0.6, you still will meet the intent of the code, but the additional tasks that you need to do is either an IR scan, so that's an infrared thermography scan, or use tracer smoke. And both of those are designed to find areas that are um, leaking air more than others. And so those need to be written down um, and then correct it. Now, some might ask, when you do the building envelope air leakage test, isn't the building pretty much complete? And for the most part, depending on when you do it, that could be, but uh, there, there could be some opportunities to maybe not put up the skin of the envelope and do the test then, so some of these areas are still exposed. If for some reason the skin is already up, and the envelope is not exposed anymore, the code states that these areas that are noted during the IR scan or the tracer smoke, using tracer smoke, don't necessarily need to be corrected. So what they call out is that all notes shall be sealed without de de destruction uh, on things. So if things need to be taken down, then you're kind of off the hook. Uh, but anything that can be, any area that could be um, sealed up can, without destruction should be sealed up. Envelope performance verification. So this is a little bit different. This is where it gets confusing. So the last slide was for air leakage this slide is for performance verification. It's two different things in the code. No matter what, you do have to do the envelope performance verification, uh, whether you're doing the air leakage test or not. So remember, we had those categories a few slides ago. Let's see, let me find it. Um, remember, if you're in the exemption category, uh, you still had to do the envelope performance verification section. So no matter what, you have to do that section. And this section is, basic, is, is a small step towards building envelope commissioning. If you're familiar with that process, then you're ahead of the game. The code is starting to incorporate envelope commissioning into it. They see, they've seen the benefits of 
uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing commissioning. There are also benefits for envelope commissioning. So your your mechanical systems aren't are, are only as good as your envelope, and so really the weakest link in the chain is your envelope. So in this section, there are four things that have to be done: a design review, installation checks a log with any deficiencies found during those installation checks, and then a final report. So the design review is done at the CD phase. Uh, it can be done more often or even uh, at the permit phase, but at the construction document phase, a design review has to be done. Installation checks, uh, that's when somebody would come out and Make, to sure, make sure that the envelope components are being installed uh, per the drawings and specifications. So they would take something that looks like this on the screen and make sure that all these connections are being made uh, and, and installed correctly. If not, they will create a deficiencies log and those items should be corrected uh, since they're still exposed before uh, any of the air leakage testing is, if you're doing air leakage testing. And then a final report needs to go both to the owner or the owner's rep and the authority having jurisdiction. So you might ask, do you need to hire a commissioning agent for envelope? The question is no, not necessarily. This verification process for the envelope performance can either be done by the code official, the designer, or an approved agency. An approved agency would then be your commissioning agent. But just know that the code officials are already uh, underwater with work and very limited on time. So I will not, I would not count on them on being your uh, doing your design review and your installation checks and a deficiency log. <laughs> um, a designer uh, very well could be, uh, and you might already have a commission agent on board. So those two options out of the three are probably uh, a little bit more viable. And then operable windows. This is a new change to the code, it's a brand new section. So we are very familiar with and, and like our windows to be operable. However, there are issues with heating and cooling when windows are open. And so this section says any opening that's operable that's 40 square feet or larger has to be interlocked with the HVAC controls. And what that means is that when that uh, so if you're familiar with uh, like this photo, you go to your favorite restaurant and they have these overhead doors that open up and you, you know, you, you get a lot of this fresh air. However, a lot of the times the, the heating and cooling systems stay on. And so what the code is saying with this new section is that when the, these doors are operable openings, it doesn't have to be a door. Um, it could be, um, it could be a window. It could be a loading dock, things of that nature. That's an operable opening. When those are opened, the controls need to get set back. And basic, and it says cooling needs to go to 90 degrees and heating needs to lower down to 55 degrees. Within 10 minutes of that being open. So if they're just going to open up this door or window or whatever you, ha whatever you may have, for less than 10 minutes, then no big deal. We'll go ahead and keep the HVAC going. But if it's going to be open for more than 10 minutes, it needs to trigger the HVAC system to set back. Now you, you say, okay, well, 40 square feet, you know, sometimes our, our doors on our main entrance are bigger than that. You know, it's part of the big vestibule. Well, okay. There, those are an, those are accepted. There are there are some exceptions with that, you know, warehouses, things like that. So with that, I am going to pause. Uh, that is the 
in the entire change for the envelope section uh, in the IECC 2021. We have two more sections to go through, which are, I think, two, one slide each. Uh, but I'm going to pause here uh, for a minute and see if there's any questions. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we do have a question for you. For the continuous insulation required under the slab on grade, is that insulation required on at any slab on grade or only at heated slabs on grade? Good question. So there are two categories in the book. Uh, let's see if I can get to that slide. I might not have put it on here. Maybe I have. Okay. So you'll see that uh, it, it covers both. So you'll see that there's a section for heated slabs and then unheated slabs. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, uh, we'll move on for the sake of time. I said there's only a couple slides left on these, but they are important from an uh, architectural standpoint. Uh, so that's why we included them in this presentation. Solar ready zone. So this is Appendix CB. This is not required by code. I'll just make that clear. However, jurisdictions can adopt this or any appendix. If they do, then it is required by code. One thing to note here is that they, uh, in the solar ready zone, so if you have to follow this appendix, uh, any electrical energy storage ready system area, so basically if you're gonna be having a battery bank or anything like that um, for a solar ready area, or if you're gonna have solar ready building, the requirements of this appendix says that that space cannot be less than two foot by four foot. So they're starting to now carve out areas in your building for storage of um, solar systems or batteries or anything of that nature. You know, who knows in the future, maybe, maybe we're using something besides batteries, but if you're gonna have a solar ready system, the solar ready zone needs to be carved out to be at least a two foot by four foot area. And then the last appendix, that was short, right? Uh, for zero energy buildings, this is appendix CC. Again, this is not required. However, there are a lot of jurisdictions that are trying to get to zero energy buildings or at least net zero energy or uh, net zero ready. Uh, that's why we've included this. Appendix CC uh, breaks it down into a couple categories. Um, either on-site renewable energy, off-site renewable energy, or a combination thereof. And so if your juris authority having jurisdiction uh, is requiring you to start following Appendix CC, which is for zero energy buildings, uh, which is progressive for the future. Um, there are calculations needed to be done on your sizes of your systems, either on-site, off-site, or a combination. And the reason I bring that up in the architectural presentation is that if you have on-site renewable energy, then you might need to start thinking about uh, the loads of your structure. Uh, if it's going to go on the roof, if it's going onto your walls, uh, or if it's going onto uh, the ground. If it's going onto the building some way uh, for on site renewable, uh, that's something that you'll need to start thinking about. And that's it for the, the presentation. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so Kevin and I will stand the line if anyone wants to submit any Q&A questions or feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask Kevin directly.
All right, Kevin, we'll give it another minute here and then I'll go ahead and end the webinar. Okay.